Hello, my name is Ryan Taylor and I am from San Francisco, California. I am a certified sommelier for the Court of Master Sommeliers America and I have over 10 years of experience in wine establishments like wine bars and restaurants in California. I have recently made the move to Madrid, Spain to acclimate into one of the world's largest wine powers. Why did I choose Spain? I chose Spain because its vicinity to other European wine powers was too appealing to pass up. I have teamed up as part of my journey with my friend and videographer Tom Cherup to bring you this YouTube series. One of our goals is to help make the world of, of Spanish wine more understood by you and everyone else. Join us on our journey as we show you our, favorites, our favorite wine bars, restaurants, wine shops, wineries, and experience locations for the best prices and the best offerings. Join us. Madrid and Derricot, my favorite bottle shop and one of the only major wine tasting experience places available in Madrid. It is owned by conveniently named Roque Madrid and Luke Derricot. Today we will be having a conversation with Luke. Come on in. Chairs for you. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Let's have a seat. Casual. Very casual. Luke, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, how you ended up spending 11 years in Spain, and finally how you ended up as a co-owner of Madrid and Derricot? Right. So, main owner. To be honest, main owner. <laughs> okay. No. Um. So I, yeah, I've been here quite a while now. So I, very quickly, I'm from England. Okay. You can probably tell. I mean. Uh, I'm from a town called Maidenhead, which is not famous, but it's near Windsor, Windsor Castle, okay. near, the, near London, basically. Uh, I did Spanish and Russian at university. Right. Came here for a year after I finished to practice my Spanish for a year in Madrid. Then I went to Moscow for a year and, surprisingly, preferred Madrid <laughs> to my town, Maidenhead, and I came back. Um, right. I did some years of teaching, which is quite classic. Moved into food tourism, started doing wine qualifications to sort of legitimize my drinking problem. Right. And then uh, I met Roque, my business partner. He's Spanish. He's a real Spanish person here. Right. We met about a decade ago, and we fell in love with Spanish wine, traveling, all this kind of idea. And ultimately, in 2018, we came together and opened a shop. 50% right. of the idea was to sell sort of slightly more interesting wines, as well as Rioja and Rivera de Classic, something else you can get. Right. And to have a little spot we could do our sort of BS free wine tasting, as we call it. Okay. So basically, it was just because Madrid, kind of, without wanting to get too poetic, kind of captured my stole. I knew I needed to be here, and it became wine as the thing that really kept me here. Okay, great. Yeah. So, in terms of getting started, when did you first realize you were passionate about the wine industry? Were you influenced by any any specific person, any specific experience? How did how did you begin? So, uh, there's actually kind of a defining moment of course I always like wine I'm English I drink too much ha 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 but it was in the town of Guadalajara which is a meh kind of commercial town sort of near Madrid out in La Mancha not a wine town and I was there on a Sunday to do a charity 5k run and the day before uh, the friend we were staying with took us out to a restaurant to eat arroz con bogavante which is like a lobster rice paella style stew now, in those days, I really just drank big, strong red wines with a view to probably getting a bit too drunk and being like, they're tasty. Never really drink white wines. Um, and she said, why don't we order a white wine with this food? And I was a bit, okay, fine. So she ordered a bottle of Albarino by the company Martin Codax. Now, nowadays, that wine is, it's a good wine, but it's quite sort of commercial in the supermarkets. But back then, it was less known, it was smaller. So I poured a glass. I didn't really touch it. And then she asked me, and I remember she went, how is the wine? Okay, tal vino? How's the wine? So I was like, oh yeah, I forgot to try it. And I had this big old gulp, and it was like when, <laughs> when the clouds part <laughs> and the rays of sun come through and the heavenly choir is like, oh, I thought, I understand now. Because she was like, yeah, yeah, this is the best wine to have with seafood. So I had this lovely big rich seafood rice and this incredibly crisp sort of citrusy zephyr of a wine that cut through it all. And I was like, oh man, I get it. And that was the, the, the key point about wine not just being a yummy 
booze, but being this thing which goes with food for an occasion. And that was kind of this, the, the thing that lit the spark after my first year here. And it's been a downward spiral to destroying my liver ever since, <laughs> essentially. Fascinating. How would you describe the concept of Madrid and Derricotte? How long has it been open? And how do you set yourself apart from other wine shops in Madrid? That is a good question. So we opened November 2018. Okay. Um, so we're happy that we're still here with a global pandemic in our second of course, year. Of course. That's a testament to the drinking prowess of the people yeah. here. Um, so the idea was, like I alluded to before, we wanted to... So I come from, I guess, a wine teaching background, you could say. And as much as I love Rioja and Rivera and the classics that you can get in Spain, we realized that even within the Spanish community, there's not a lot of knowledge of other wines. So we wanted to yeah. sell kind of as many different regions as we could, try and find small producers. We have got a few wines here and there that are from well-known producers, but we try to keep it sort of small. Yep. And wine tastings, what we think set up, sets us apart a little bit, there are not that many places, and specifically not many shops, specifically with an English language bent, that offer regular tasting. So in the, in the good old days, when we had tourism at, at quite a high level, we were doing three tastings a day, or offering three tastings a day, every day of the week. If we doubled up, fine. We're both here, one group downstairs, one, we were trying to be as sort of flexible as possible for the tasting side, because right. anyone could come in and buy a little bottle of wine for five, 10, 45 euros, but we wanted people to go away having learned something. So we always say like, if one tourist, for example, goes home having learned one new grape or one new region, that's a victory for us. Yeah. Because even though we love Rioja, there's so much wine here, so we just try and take it on our mission to kind of divulge that information to the drunken masses. Um, so that's probably what set, sets us apart is the regular tastings and I'm quite good at English. <laughs> so, so, and Rocky obviously is fluent. So yes. we want to also have this kind of, look, we're here to teach you if you're visiting, we can do it in perfect English and Spanish as well. Kind of thing. So that would be, I think, our USP, the bilingual uh, tasting element. That's great. I love the emphasis on education. It's clearly been working well. Um, since we talked a little bit about opening, I'm curious to, to, to hear, I'm sure we're all curious to hear, were there any challenges that you faced when opening Madrid and Derricot? Right. Oh, there's a lot to that question. Challenges, yeah. So, uh, I would say, well, if we think about when it sort of started, I mean, the first challenge is where do we put the bloody shop? If you think, I want to have a shop, where? Um, because you want to have a place, hopefully, with enough footfall and activity that people are coming in and buying wines. I don't want to be out in the middle of nowhere. But also, we knew we wanted to try and tap into that tourist market of making ourselves as accessible as possible to the average Joe who's like with a phone going, where the hell am I? So we knew we wanted to be near as enough to the center. So we looked at a few places. And this place, I mean, we're a two minute walk from the Plaza Mayor, the main you know square of Madrid. So location was the first thing. We also knew we wanted to have a separate space for tasting. So upstairs we do sort of small group tastings. We knew we wanted, if possible, which we found, a downstairs area as well, for like a kind of a wine cave vibe for bigger group tastings. So we found the location, tick. Then it's like, right, you know, we're in, a, we're in the second largest city in the EU and we're starting a new business. So obviously you've got this uphill battle that nobody knows you exist. You know, still to this day, we have some people come in who maybe haven't walked around the street for a long time and go, oh, is this new? How long has it been here? You're like, two and a half years. Like, what? So some people just don't see you. So you have to sort of start from scratch, building an online, online profile. Also, given that we're tapping into a tourist market, we are trying to get ourselves known so people know we exist to do kind of events and stuff. So yeah, the online presence is key for the tastings. The other problem is obviously competition. Because <laughs> there's a lot of wine shops here and there's a lot of supermarkets here. So another challenge was thinking how to organize selection of wines because we didn't want to be a shop where you can buy two, three euro bottles of wine. There's no point, we've got supermarkets. If you want that level of drinkable but like meh wines that you don't need to come here but we didn't want to be the super expensive shop so we've got a nice range the gr grand majority is like seven to 17 euros so we have to choose a selection and try and create a profile of shop which made it a shop worth going to when we have so many other shops around us so it's competition is another thing um we're number one on google in a couple of years Thanks to those tourists leaving yeah. nice reviews. Yeah. So it was a combination of we're starting from scratch, you've got to kind of make a name for yourself, being active online, offering something different, 
and finding the right sort of physical spot as well. And I think we more or less did it. Obviously, we're still here despite COVID, so something's obviously working. But uh, it was all in like kind of scientific planning mode beforehand, and it seems to have worked. Great. All right. It obviously, um, competition is always a huge um, factor when considering starting a business. Um, but another challenge, of course, the whole world is facing these days um, is the COVID-19 pandemic. So here in Spain, um, the tourism industry has definitely taken a big slowdown throughout the whole um, coronavirus process. But do you think there's any silver lining from the COVID-19 um, affecting tourism? Is there anything beneficial that you have come to realize or that has happened since the pandemic began? So, yeah, this has been an intriguing <laughs> period for us. Um, so, regarding good old COVID, within one weekend, the tourism tap was like turned off. So we had loads of tastings booked, all these kind of Airbnb things booked, and suddenly it was like, you see like kind of people jumping ship, and it was like cancelling, cancelling, cancelling. Fair enough, they can't come here. It's a global pandemic, fair enough. So, obviously, it's terrible because our company was kind of really a big thing for the tourist industry. We were pushing tastings with foreigners. But we were very quick to react, so we had to kind of change the chip, right? So, okay, so we need to focus on the national. So very quickly, within the first two weeks, before it, we thought it was going to carry on until the following year, we quickly started doing online tastings. Um, we would prepare a box. You could buy the box. We had a, a timetable of when we were going to open each bottle. We would all open it together. My business partner was stuck down in the south of Spain, so we did Instagram Lives. Um, and we were moving an obscene number of boxes of wine. The beautiful silver lining, if you could put it that way, it is a silver lining, is throughout the sort of the phase where we became online, we unlocked a market which we'd never been able to tap into, which was people who lived in Madrid, but nowhere near our shop. You know, people who would never just casually come and buy a bottle of wine in person because they live miles away. And they, they were now buying wine on our website. So that pushed us to set up our online shop, which is now working really well because people who don't live near us know us and buy from us. So in a way, even though COVID has been awful, it's terrible for everyone, including us, because we don't have any tourists, because tastings is our real kind of original lifeblood, it kind of pushed us quicker to set up our online presence, which these days is working almost better than the actual physical shop, because, you know, people can see the wines you've got without having to kind of mask up like we are now and try and come all the way down here in person. They can just go, cool. And we offer like free deliveries on like orders of six or more. So people are like, okay, I'll buy a box for the next couple of weeks. So if there is a silver lining, it's the online twist, which we hadn't had and now we've got, and it's working very well. Other than that, I want tourists back. <laughs> Amazing, I'm so thrilled you were able to tap into a side market that wasn't even part of the original you know, primary plan. So that's amazing that it's worked out for you. Um, since we're talking about um, the evolution of business, how do you see the business in five years? Where do you see it going? <laughs> hopefully what, what is your, yes, hopefully it's still going, <laughs> but what is your um, perfect scenario? What, what, what will it look like? Obviously, we'd like the, the shop to return to normal regular tastings, uh, as many days of the week as we can. We have this, we have a couple of these kind of pipe dreams, Rocky and I. Um, some of them are things that we generally want to do, some of them are just like, it would be logical. Like I can see a logical evolution with one day be having some kind of little tasting wine bar kind of vibe, like a Madrid and Daracot wine bar thing. Not, not a restaurant, but a place okay. where you can get glasses of wine, little nibbles and stuff, we yeah. choose the wine, that kind of idea, it seems logical. Obviously, this is probably a, a dream of many people like me, which will be very expensive to realise, but we'd love to be able to make a wine, or at least get a wine which we can have our sort of logo on, like a Madrid and Daracot wine. Yeah. Try and find a winery who can maybe even make us a wine, because obviously I'm not a winemaker. Right. I mean, I can squash, ferment some grapes in my bath, that's not wine, you know what I mean? Right. But we could, <laughs> if we got a Madrid and Daracot wine, that'd be really lovely as well. Um, other than that, we just want to have, we kind of want to, I think we'll take time to re return back to where we were, but we just want to have everything functioning well here, so then we can expand. My big pipe dream, which I don't know if Rocky even knows about, um, is to make an urban, an urban winery. Okay. Which I tried one in London, which is where 
they bring all the, the, the grape mash, all the liquid, to that place in the centre of London and they ferment and create the wines there under the train tracks. And I have seen places in Madrid, like for those of you who know Madrid, there's a place called the Matadero, it's like an art yep. installation area, yep. old warehouses. I'd love to have an urban winery there where you can go and actually have wine made in the middle of Madrid. Fine, those yeah. kind of things. We're talking like, not in five years, that'd be like maybe when I'm 50. Right. I'm rich. But the future goal, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> but it will always be alcoholic is the case. Of course. But of yeah, course. those are points in my view. Good, great. Um, well, obviously, uh, we're fans of this place. We're so excited it's here. We're excited to see how it progresses. Um, thanks for your time and My for pleasure. letting us be here. Yeah, I'll give you another elbow. There Perfect. you go. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Come back soon, guys. Yeah. Well, thank you all for watching. Um, come on down to Madrid and Derricot at Calle Duque de Rivas 8, next to Tirso de Molina in Madrid. We'll see you next time. Cool. Ciao.